we should move on to Phil, uh, last but not least, and, uh, and then we can continue the discussions afterwards. And we'll have to say a special thank you to Phil for getting up early in Dublin to, uh, to be able to join our, uh, our session this afternoon. Okay, Phil. Oh, do you want to try screen sharing again, Phil? here today um, and also thanks to all the previous speakers there were some really excellent talks there um, also my apologies if my mind isn't the sharpest today um, as you just said um, I my, my alarm clock got off a bit earlier than it normally would on a Thursday um, so anyway uh, I want to talk with you about the rare earth element geochemistry of carbonate minerals at the George Fisher deposit and how we may be able to use that to determine hydrothermal alteration. Um, this is part of my PhD project in which I was supervised by Joe Magnol and Sarah Gleason. Um, and before we get started, I'd also like to acknowledge um, all my co-authors and the geology teams at Mount Isa Mines for the great support throughout the project. Um, the project was uh, funded by the Helmholtz Association. So um, just a few words on the Carpentaria province, um, as I'm sure that uh, most of the audience will actually know more about it than I do. Um, but I, what I'd like to point out is that where we're, we're actually uh, situated in a very special province where we have some of the highest value zinc and lead deposits of, of our planet. Um, and those deposits are hosted in those paleo to mesoproterozoic sedimentary basins where we have barely any deformation and metamorphism in the north in the MacArthur Basin and then in the Mount Isa Inlayer, um, which this seminar is fo focusing on. Um, we actually have quite a complicated tectonic history. And now that complicated tectonic history is why all these deposits have a very complex parogenesis. Um, and there's a wide time span of proposed mineralizing events. Um, for, and for these reasons, there, there has been quite a debate in the last decades uh, over whether the ores have formed through SEDEX processes, so the sedimentary exhalative processes, where we exhale a hydrothermal fluid into the stra stratified water column, or if we actually precipitate the ores during um, replacement processes in, in the subsurface, either during synburial diagenesis or during lead uh, tectonic events. Now, when we're exploring for these systems, we're also especially interested in the footprints of these systems. And as you can imagine, a SEDEX system will have a very different uh, footprint uh, when we disperse the metals over a long distance, whereas in the subsurface during replacement processes, we're much more limited by things like permeability or the fluid rock interaction along the way. Now, um, a lot of the footprint studies in the Carpentaria have been based on the SEDEX model. Um, and in a nutshell, SEDEX model would include that we're co-precipitating um, our base metal sulfides with fine grain pyrite and also with carbonate minerals. Um, and then it's been recognized that if this is the case, if we have a SEDEX system, we would have a fine grain pyrite halo around the ore bodies as well as a ferromanganese carbonate halo around the deposits. Now, I think this ferromanganese carbonate halo has been described for quite a few of these carpenteria sink systems. Um, however, we have to keep in mind that there's also background diagenetic processes that can actually lead to uh, the enrichment of ferromanganese carbonates. And we also need to think about our host rocks, which are typically dolomitic siltstones. So we already have a high concentration of um, 
of dolomite in in the host rocks now i guess uh, throughout all the research and especially in recent years um, it's been shown that at least a few of the carpenteria sink systems actually formed during replacement of the host rock rather than SEDEX processes. Um, and if we think about that, um, it's a whole different story of how we are looking at our carbonates and, and the um, potential carbonate footprint. So we need to find and understand um, ways to identify our carbonate footprint. Now there's some, some really excellent work um, being done at Mount Isa by Ben Andrew and Sean Barker, looking at the isotope geochemistry of the carbonates around the Mount Isa system. And we here in, in our study, we want to focus at the rare earth elements from George Fisher. Now, um, let's zoom into the project area. Um, we're situated uh, near the town of Mount Isa, where we have the Urquhart Shell Formation. Um, previous talk by Ali was, was giving quite a, quite a nice introduction into the Urquhart Shell, so I'll keep it brief here. Um, I would probably say that the Urquhart Shell is a pretty special rock unit. However, when you look at an unmineralized sample from the Urquhart Shell, you'd say that's a perfectly normal um, uh, Proterozoic siltstone mudstone unit. Um, and I guess you're right, it's just uh, that the Urquhart Shale um, is host to uh, three of the world's largest base metal deposits that are hosted in sedimentary basins, namely the Mount Isa, Hilton, and George Fisher deposit. And in, in our study here, we were focusing on drill core samples, drill core logging, and drill core sampling um, through the main ore bodies at George Fisher. Um, and we also had access to a basically unmineralized barren drill hole through the Urquhart Shale Formation, uh, which I'll refer to as the background or shower flats drill hole. Now, this background drill hole was especially important um, to get a baseline composition of the Urquhart Shale and uh, for this part of the study, especially the carbonates in the background. Um, now, based on this baseline, we were then able to evaluate the hydrothermal footprint of the system at George Fisher on the carbonate minerals. Um, how did we do that? Well, we applied a variety of petrographic whole rock and in situ techniques. I won't go through them all in detail, but what I would like to point out here that uh, is that on the one hand for laser ablation analysis um, for rare earth elements in carbonate minerals, we actually need quite a large spot size in order um, to, to meet our detection limits for the rare earth elements. Um, and then I would also like to point out that when we're using in situ techniques and whole rock techniques and we try to combine them, we actually need um, to go up and down in scale using our petrography to combine it with the whole rock data, uh, as for example here, the um, whole rock quantitative mineralogy done by XRD. Um, only if we combine it with our petrography, we get the full value of our whole rock and in situ data, I think. Um, so before we dig into the data too much, I'd like to uh, review a few facts about rare earth elements. Um, I won't I won't go to, into too much detail here, but I'd just like to point out that uh, rare earth elements are trace components in more, most uh, crustal fluids. Um, so they would be um, depleted relative to chondrite, uh, chondrite. So all the rare earth element plots you'll see in the following will be chondrite normalized. Uh, so fluids are uh, depleted relative to chondrite, whereas crustal rocks are generally enriched compared to chondrite. Um, now, what is really cool about the rare earth elements is that as a group, they behave quite similarly compared to most other elements of the periodic table, um, and they are rather immobile. However, among the rare earth elements, there are subtle differences in the solubility between light rare earth elements, which would be these elements here, and the heavy rare earth elements, which would be these here. Um, and those subtle differences in solubility, they actually occur due to differences in physical chemical conditions of, of fluids, for example. So um, I guess you can see that as there's quite a bit of variability in the hydrothermal fluids um, that I, I show with the, from the literature. Um, so it's on the one hand concentration, but then there is also 
different rare earth element uh, signatures in response to different fluid chemistries. Um, now, what's also interesting about the rare earth elements is that they uh, partition into carbonate minerals quite well. So if we now understand the rare earth element composition of carbonate minerals, we may be able to um, trace back our fluid composition. So with that in mind, um, let's first have a look at the whole rock mineralogy of these rocks. So in our, what we see when we compare our background Urquhart shell, which is shown in blue, um, compared with the rocks from George Fisher, which would be here in uh, purple, orange, and red, um, is that, that uh, calcite is enriched in the background Urquhart shell relative to the rocks from George Fisher, whereas dolomite is enriched in the Urquhart shell samples compared to our background Urquhart shell. Now, what, what does that actually look like? Um, we, we have observed quite a few different um, uh, carbonate phases in the Urquhart shell formation. Um, there's very fine grain carbonate, macritic and triatal carbonate, both calcites and dolomites that all have also been described previously. However, um, those, those carbonates are typically too fine grained to be analyzed for rare earth elements by laser ablation ICPMS analysis. Um, if we then look at the ore samples at George Fisher, we see that we have uh, cogenetic co carbonate formation as indicated by these 120 degree angles um, with sphalerite. So the black here would be sphalerite. Um, and uh, we both have dolomite and calcite co-precipitating with the sphalerite and with hydrothermal quartz in this infill sample, for example, here. Now, we're pretty sure that these are hydrothermal carbonates at George Fisher as they are syn ore. Um, however, we won't find um, such highly mineralized zones with hydrothermal carbonates in our background rocks as they are barren. Um, so we actually, if we want to compare our background to our mineralized samples, um, we need to look somewhere else and those would be the nodular carbonates. So next few slides will be on the nodular carbonates where when we look at our background shovel flats drill hole, we see that the nodular carbonates mostly uh, consist of calcite with a fairly homogeneous uh, cathodoluminescent signal. Um, and then when we analyze our rare earth element composition of these, um, of these carbonates, we see that we have light rare earth element enriched um, signatures compared to chondrite. And those are fairly similar to the respective whole rock analysis of, this, of these samples. Um, and also similar to um, shale standards as the post in Australian shale. Now, if we look at nodular carbonate samples from the George Fisher deposit, what we see is that we have um, sphalerite replacing the carbonates and we here have also much more dolomite um, than compared to our background nodular carbonates. Um, what we also see is that we have quite a heterogeneous uh, calcitoluminescent signal and what's interesting now is that we have quite flat light rare earth, uh, we have light rare earth element depletion and quite flat rare earth element signatures both compared to our um, shale reference values, but then also to the respective whole rock and compared to our background um, carbonates, which would, would be more or less like this. Um, so now this light earth element depletion is actually a common feature of not only the nodular carbonates at George Fisher, but also of all the hydrothermal carbonates at George Fisher that we analyzed. Um, so this would be a median through all the hundreds of laser ablation ICPMS um, analysis that we did. And what, what, what is quite clear here, I think, is that the George Fisher carbonates are light earth element depleted relative to the whole rock from George Fisher and the whole rock from our background drill hole, um, but also to our background pre or carbonates. And I think this would indicate that our pre or calcite, our pre or carbonate, was uh, more sensitive to the hydrothermal alteration during the mineralizing event. And this um, will have led to calcite dissolution and dolomitization of pre or calcite, and also that light earth element depletion in those neoformed carbonates. Um, you may ask now what, what actually caused that light rare earth element depletion. And I, I have to say there are multiple ways of how you can produce that. But what made the most sense to me 
um, is that we're looking at saline fluids. And actually in recent years, there have been a couple of studies looking at uh, numerical, both numerical modeling and also experimental work, um, which have shown that the, especially the lighter earth elements are fractionated in saline fluids. They are more soluble in saline fluids compared to heavier earth elements. And as a result, um, saline fluids will produce hydrothermal carbonates that are lighter earth element depleted, which would actually quite nicely explain our lighter earth element depletion in the George Fisher carbonates. Now, um, is that actually useful to determine our alteration footprint? I guess um, we have to investigate these systems in in the 3D space and George Fisher is perhaps not the best place to do that because we don't have the spatial coverage and as you know uh, there's quite a bit of deformation in the area. Um, however if we would take this to a uh, fairly undeformed system and we would look at the carbonates in the host rocks but then also in for example in distal veins to these systems we may be able to test this hypothesis if we see um, lighter earth element depleted carbonates around the system which would indicate uh, saline hydro hydrothermal fluid interaction so with that i'd like to leave you here um, and i hope i could convince you that rare earth element chemistry of carbonates can be useful um, to determine hydrothermal alteration and may aid future exploration programs in the Carpentaria province. Thanks very much. That was an excellent talk. Thanks, uh, thanks very much, Phil. Um, well, we're waiting for uh, the attendees to uh, come up with any other questions. Um, I just wanted to ask, are you continuing on with any further work in this area? Uh, as a follow-on from your PhD, or have you jumped on to work on different things at the moment? Um, there's a bit more um, data floating around that I'm, I'm writing up. Um, so hopefully soon there will be a paper on pyrite geochemistry, um, in situ geochemistry from George Fisher. Um, and there's a bit more laser data that we could work on, but I'm uh, now based here in Dublin to work at ICRAC, um, where I'll be looking at 3D modeling of the Black Angel deposit in Greenland. Um, so uh, still a uh, basin hosted sinklet, but in a, a, a bit of a different climate, I guess. <laughs> Yes, yes, exactly. Um, and so I know that was one aspect of your PhD work. Were there other aspects that um, uh, in terms of halo definition, other insights from some of the other work on your PhD that would um, help with exploration and halo definition? Um, yeah, I, I, I would hope so. So what, what we also so did, um, I guess I touched on it a little bit, we looked at the whole rock um, mineralogy and uh, lithotric chemistry of the rocks. Uh, again, comparing our background um, unmineralized drill hole to the rocks at George Fisher. Um, and what we found is that we, we generally have calcite and albite and chloride um, depletion at George Fisher, whereas we see dolomite or anchorite um, and phyllosilicate enrichment at George Fisher. Um, and that could be linked to um, trace element um, geochemical uh, depletions or enrichments at George Fisher that we could potentially use um, by an alteration index, for example, um, in future lithogeochemical um, projects. Excellent, thanks. Uh, we have a question here from Rob Brotherford. Have you considered looking at the siderite alteration around century? Um, no, well, it would be it would be interesting to to look at century. And as I said, um, there are many um, many of these deposits have um, have been studied in terms of their carbonate halos and been observed anywhere. Um, I think Century would be a, a very good place to look at a fairly undeformed system. I guess that's where that uh, question is, is aiming at. Um, however, with siderite, there's a problem that siderite doesn't incorporate so much rare earth elements. Um, the rare earth elements mostly substitute for the calcium in the crystal lattice of carbonates. And in, well, in siderite, we don't, we don't really have any. Um, so, yeah, it, I think Century would be a cool place, however, Siderite might not be the right mineral to, to try it. 
Excellent. And I just see there's a, a question in the chat from Lucy Chapman. Very interesting, she says. And straight up, <laughs> have you paired this up with the ferroin carbonate anchorite and siderite zones? Um, yeah, so uh, answer, thanks. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks, Lucy. I, uh, I, um, yeah, I guess I guess it's a similar answer. You can, um, I mean, in anchorite and and dolomite, you can analyze the, the rare earth elements. Um, and uh, yeah, so we, we did analyze the dolomites and anchorites at George Fisher. Um, I guess Lucy's maybe aiming at the fine grained um, carbonates, anchorites um, that she described. Um, and those were too fine grained for us to analyze. So I guess those would be um, in, in the matrix more and then, then uh, yeah, macritic um, cements. So it, it, would, it would be really nice to do that. Um, and I try to do some analysis using the electron microprobe. Um, but then the detection limits were too, too high for us to get down to the rare earth elements there. So it's a bit problematic. I think there is potential there when our uh, analytical techniques improve. Excellent. Well, thanks very much, Phil. And again, thanks for getting up early to join us. And I'd well, like to- My pleasure. Just oh, sorry. Before you finish. Um, yeah, really interesting. Um, the, the um, uh, you know, I, leaving aside the, the manganese, you know, whether manganese carbonate is, I mean, I think the exhalative versus the place of argument ended a long time ago, um, <laughs> 20 years or more, but the, uh, the, the, when you look at certainly the, you know, what, what we've done in the, in the area that starts from the south of Shovel Flat and goes all the way to Mount Isa, um, you wouldn't look at Shovel Flat and say it's out of the halo. In fact, it's sort of, um, it's, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's still in the outer, it looks like it's still in the outer halo. So um, um, maybe it's, maybe it's in the, maybe it's out of the rare earth halo. And it's certainly not out of the, not out of the um, sort of what you would empirically say is the halo of the of the deposit. So I'm not just if you have, wondered if you had any comment on that. Um, yeah, I think I think you're you're right. I mean, these these systems are, are just so huge, and it's actually I guess it's very difficult to get um, completely unmineralized or completely unaltered rocks. So then it's going to be an issue of um, what uh, what we're looking at, what minerals we're looking at, what has been affected uh, versus what what hasn't, and I think that's where the rare earth work could help because um, we I think we may need to um, alter the carbonates more uh, more intensely than other minerals perhaps um, um, to change the rare earth element chemistry, um, and then I think even if there is some hydrothermal overprint at our shower flats hole, um, it would still be our least altered, um, uh, least altered example of the air culture. And that's really then the best we can do, I guess. 